What's going on, everybody? Artist part of the ring here again. Back at ya with another apron bump. And today's apron bump, we are going back in time. WrestleMania X. Or WrestleMania 10, if you're an asshole. <laughs> Whatever. WrestleMania 10, March 20th, 1994, from Madison Square Garden. Who doggy? Um, full transparency, I was born in March of 93, so as I go through this show and we dive back in time, review all of these matches, shit, and shit on all of the terrible spots and bad matches that happen on this show, it's not lost on me that at this point in my life, I was just trying not to shit my pants. So that's not lost on me, I understand where I'm coming from. I understand what leg I have to stand on. I might criticize Bret Hart or Yokozuna during this show, but at this point, I probably had caked baby shit on my back, so who am I to talk, really, right? Anyways, where was I? WrestleMania 10. So this kind of begins my journey through the wrestling wars of the 90s. Now, at this point, there really wasn't... It was just kind of getting started, right? ECW hadn't really come into the picture yet. Um, WCW was really just, I don't even know if they were making a profit at this point, but Nitro's just a few, actually I think it's like a year and a half out, right? After this is when Nitro starts, is where things really get going. But I wanted to start at WrestleMania 10 because, I mean in all honesty, I just wanted to see Bret Hart versus Owen Hart. That's really the main thing. I didn't just want to see this match, I wanted to see this match and then the culmination to their SummerSlam match and everything in between. I think that that's... A storyline that's always fascinated me, you know, looking out, looking in from the outside. But obviously I didn't live through this, or at least I didn't, I wasn't watching actively. Obviously I was just one years old, but um, yeah, it's always a rivalry I, I was, I've always really wanted to follow and never got the opportunity. I really never got an opportunity to uh, witness Owen Hart at his peak and when he was putting on his best work because I caught the tail end of his stuff he was doing. You know, with uh, you know, teaming with Jeff Jarrett or um, even like the 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 Nation stuff, that was all good and fun. Like he's very entertaining, but I feel like this part of his career, he was really hitting on all cylinders, and especially with the matches he had with Brett. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> this isn't exactly a hot take, but man, amazing, amazing stuff that they were able to do in the ring. Obviously, obviously they had the chemistry working, training together for their whole lives, and um, just that innate, you know, knowledge of what the other guy is going to do. Um, both guys are incredibly knowledgeable on how to structure a match, how to build, how to pace, um, when to do certain things, the little details and everything they do, and that's all exemplified in the opening match of the show. And um, yeah, really good stuff here from them, but... <laughs> In all honesty, that was probably really the high part of the show was, this op that was the opening match because, I mean, it's just a weird time in WWF, you know? Hogan left recently and uh, WWF and Vince McMahon, they're just sitting there trying to decide which way they want to go, who they want to build as their star for the future. I mean, is it Yokozuna? Is it Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Razor Ramon? All these wacky characters that they have. It's like, man, well, I have all these these colors and all these loud noises. Like, how do I make sense of all this? And how do we coherently build a wrestling show around all these characters? And who is going to lead that charge? Because right now, you know, I believe this is like around the steroid trial stuff too. And some other legal stuff that Vince is dealing with and other people on the roster are dealing with. It's really a shitty time to be in the WWF right now. But obviously... They end up kicking out of that, and that's another part of why I wanted to start during this time period. Because people, you know, I've always heard that the mid-90s is a real down period for WWF. But that doesn't deter me f from watching all this stuff. If anything, it just fascinates me and brings me in because I almost... It's like a car crash. You want to look, right? I want to see what made this time period so like lackluster because there's almost a charm in seeing how bad a lot of the stuff was, right? And not everything was bad, but there was a lot of bad stuff on this show and in this time period in general. Um, but it, it just really interests me how, you know, they go from here in 1994 
And then within like three, four years, they're just on fire, like a peak performance, peak business, just in a matter of years. I mean, think about that, right? So we're here in 2020, right? Think about WrestleMania this past year. What is it, 36? Is it 36? Whatever. Let's, let's say it was WrestleMania 36 this past year in 2020. Think seven years before that. Yeah, WrestleMania 29, which I believe was what, the, the second Rock Cena one? Think of WrestleMania 29. Actually, you know, the last WrestleMania is a bad example because that obviously stands out because of the whole corona thing. But take uh, WrestleMania 35, right? Now you have, you obviously you have women main eventing, so that's a little bit different. But all in all, WrestleMania 35 and WrestleMania 28, seven years before that, they feel pretty much the same. The general feel of WWE feels the same that it did seven years ago. But you look at the disparity between WrestleMania 10 and WrestleMania 17, still a seven year gap, but completely, completely different products that you're witnessing. And that's the part that really intrigues me with this time period, right? Because so much changes in such a rapid block of time. Within seven years, the entire landscape has completely changed. And as somebody who wasn't watching during that time period, I'm I'm fascinated because like why does why do these things change so much? Is it because of the competition? That's what I assume. Because once WCW and ECW start kicking off, Vince McMahon is like, okay, I have to I have to really buckle down and look at what we're producing. And I have to change things based on the audience and what they want. And come 1997, 1996 is when the Attitude Era starts. It's when the product completely changes from these wacky characters that we see on this show, WrestleMania 10, and it becomes more realistic and more, you know, based on reality of what people are like in that time period. You don't have clowns and fucking garbage men and bowlers and Mounties walking around, you know, with the fucking pyro and the colors and the crazy wacky voices. You don't have that anymore. You have real gritty people. And I really, really am interested to see that transition because right now we're all, we're in the flashy characters phase. So what is that transition like both in WWF, WCW and throw an ECW in that mix. And that's why I plan to watch all of these, you know, in parallel to each other on the same timeline to see how each promotion interacts with each other and how each promotion kind of determines where the other promotions go as a result. You know, the wrestling wars of the 90s just made everything so volatile. Everything mattered and everything was so important in how the shows were structured because if you had a shitty show, the other show was going to gain viewers and it might just be a trickle down effect and it might just be a slippery slope and it might just all snowball and you might go out of business based on one show. So it's a kind of balancing act. It's a competition and I, that, that whole dichotomy really, really interests me and I've always wanted to watch it go down in real time. So this is what... This is where we start doing that, and this is what it's all about. WrestleMania 10, let's get into it. Who doggy? Um, so like I said, 1994, Madison Square Garden. Show opens up, and it feels big, right? Yeah, obviously, it's MSG. Crowds packed, I think, right? Was it sold out? Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. I assume it was sold out because it looks sold out. And it's WrestleMania, right? It's just got that feel to it. You got... Jerry the King Lawler and Vince McMahon on commentary. I think King's like pretty new to commentary at this point, right? Because he's still kind of a, a character on screen as far as, you know, like an in-ring in wrestler goes. Obviously at the tail end of his career, but I think he's still a prominent um, character like in the ring. And um, so he's obviously <laughs> healing it up on commentary. Early Jerry the King Lawler is hilarious to listen to. A lot of it doesn't age well. But um, <laughs> just very interesting to see how, um, I mean, he's not too different than he was like in the Attitude Era, right? But he's just more, it was one liner after one liner after one liner. And a lot of it was good. A lot of it was cringe, but all entertaining in its own way, right? And then you yeah, have Vince McMahon who, and I don't know how I feel about Vince McMahon on commentary. A lot of it was very corny. He wasn't very good at calling moves, but he had this energy about him that for some reason worked in certain cases, but was a little over the top and weird in other cases. We'll get to that as we go on. But so yeah, Vince and, 
Vince and King on commentary. You have Little Richard singing America the Beautiful, which is uh, pretty sad because he just recently passed away. But it was cool to see him, such a big wrestling fan, performing on this stage. Um, you have some lame fireworks, which kind of, <laughs> you know, nowadays you have these, you know, incredibly elaborate pyro setups to open the show. You have fireworks from the ceiling and the floor from the sides. And this show is just like, and then it was done. But nonetheless, it's WrestleMania. So fuck it. Right. So as we alluded to earlier, the opening match, Bret Hart versus Owen Hart. Holy shit, what a match. I had I had high expectations going into this match, but these guys absolutely met every single one of them and more. Right off the bat, Owen Hart's theme song is so underrated. After watching this show, I literally put it on my gym playlist. It is so hype. Um, and it got me really amped up to watch this match, but other than that, man, this match was just, it was so ahead of its time. Because you watch this match now in 2020, you might think, oh, that's a pretty good match. But in 1994, where we're just a few years removed from seeing Hogan and Andre bumbling around the ring trying to coherently have a match, now, a few years later, you have Brett and Owen Hart tearing it up like this. Like I said, man, things during this time period were changing at such a rapid rate. That a show in 1994 was completely foreign to a show in 1991 or 1990 or something like that. And even stuff after this. I'm not, there was not a lot of stuff after this within the next, you know, decade or so that matched up to this style of match. And the quality of this match that they were putting on. Really, really awesome stuff here. Um, I did notice the camera angles. For one, they're very, like, dramatic and very different than what we see nowadays. But I noticed... Um, I'm recording this just a few weeks after Edge and Randy Orton had their match, the the greatest match ever, where they used a lot of these camera angles in that match. So I guess I didn't really realize that at the time, but I guess that was kind of a callback to this Brett and Owen match. Or maybe it's just something they did pretty often during this time period. I don't really know. I didn't really notice it otherwise in the show, but maybe I'm just uh, blind. Who knows? But so like I said, very, very ahead of its time. Just in how smooth everything was. You know, you have the chain wrestling in the beginning, the feel-out process, as you do. Um, but everything was just so perfect. I don't know how to describe it. I mean, because, you know, the two guys are jockeying for position. Chain wrestling. Brett sends Owen, Owen to the outside. Owen gets frustrated. So Owen then begins to, you know, he's the heel in this match. So then he starts to kind of take the cheap ways out, you know, whether it's pulling Bret Hart's hair to get him down on the mat or, you know, hitting him with low blows to get into the sharpshooter. A lot of the stuff he was doing was very subtle. The low blow wasn't that subtle, but like the hair pulling to like get him in position and stuff like that. Very, very subtle and nuanced. And really, when you have that kind of nuance and attention to detail, it really translates to a believable match. It translates into something that's like, okay, this is an actual struggle. It wasn't a dance. This match wasn't two guys collaborating to make a fancy dance. I mean, obviously, yes, they were collaborating, but that's not how it was portrayed, right? Today, you might have the Lucha Bros and the fucking Young Bucks. It's more Cirque de Soleil than a pro wrestling match. But Bret Hart versus Owen Hart, WrestleMania 10, that it felt like a struggle during the whole match. It felt like a back and forth struggle. It felt snug. And like I said, it just didn't feel like a choreographed dance. It felt like two guys trying to win a wrestling match, which I think is why this match is so well received and why this match is such a kind of a, a, a milestone, kind of a, a pivot point for wrestlers nowadays to go back and look on and what makes a really good match that stands the test of time as this one does. Really good stuff here. Like I said, Owen was so... The, the style that Owen wrestled in, if you watch it now, you're like, oh yeah, he's a pretty good wrestler. But in 1994, that dude was such, he was so ahead of his time. Um, I almost think he was probably even born maybe a little too early. But with just the athleticism and the transitions and the counters that he was able to pull off, the flips, flipping when it's necessary, not just for flipping's sake. Really good stuff here by Owen. And it's really good to see him wrestling 
in this time period, which I really haven't done much of, as I mentioned, and just how smooth he was and how good he was, because I, I don't know if I've ever really been able to properly appreciate how good Owen was, but he really showed it in this match. And even Brett, you could say the same thing about Brett. I never, I was, I started watching after Brett was gone, and Brett was so good at the basics. At, at, you know, I practice Muay Thai. And my coach said something to me one day. It's probably a very common saying, but it was the first time I heard it. It's better to be an expert at the basics than have a basic knowledge of expert tactics. And that applies to so many things, not only in sports and athletics, but in life as well. And especially in pro wrestling. And that's what Bret Hart was all about. He was an expert at the fundamentals and didn't worry about being flashy or you know doing things to get cheap pops he was really really good at the fundamentals which is the foundation that you need for a good match and that's why he was able to have so many great matches it's because he was such a good i mean his name's the excellence of execution but that's not just a a thing to put on a t-shirt that's what he was there was one spot it was just like a russian leg sweep which is like a very common move but it looked so good it looked like <laughs> as close as you can get to like a real life, like if you're in a fight with somebody and you want to do a Russian leg sweep on somebody. Obviously, you probably couldn't, but that he made it look snug and to the point where it looked like a believable, really smooth looking move. Just simple stuff like that. Suplexes, snap mares, easy stuff, but he did it so well and it made it look so believable. I think that's really where the, the genius of Bret Hart comes into play. I think that's why he doesn't really come up a lot as far as, you know, when people bring up their favorite wrestlers ever or the best wrestler ever, I don't think Bret Hart really comes into that number one spot that often with people. But I think that just he was just so consistently good and he wasn't flashy. And maybe that's the reason. But I really loved his performance in this match in conjunction with how good Owen was. And, you know, you just have that combination and it's going to be magic every single time. But uh, ultimately, Owen Hart wins with a he counters a victory roll into a roll up, you know, good. Out of nowhere win, but it was out of nowhere to the point where it made sense in the story. You know, because the whole build up here is Bret Hart is the one that gets all the attention. Bret Hart has all the fame. He's in the main event. He's on the marquees. But Owen Hart thinks he's better than him. Owen Hart thinks he's better than his brother. And he's looking out. He's looking to prove it here in this match. And he's able to catch Bret with a quick roll up, getting the win. But it's also kind of a, I don't want to say a fluke win, but it gives it, it keeps Brett looking strong, which is key. You don't need to do a count out or a disqualification to keep a guy looking strong. You can have a legitimate victory like this, but then still walk away from the match thinking, okay, Brett's still really good, but Owen got the better of him in this particular match. So everything from beginning to end was executed perfectly in this match. And I think that's why a lot of people give this match five stars. Awesome, awesome stuff here. Like I said, this is kind of th this rivalry is why I wanted to start in this time period, and I am already happy with my decision because this was awesome stuff. But that is really where the high points stop because <laughs> after this match, you're now you might be asking, man, what do you what do you follow a match of the decade like Bret Hart versus Owen Hart? What do you what do you follow that with? Clearly, the answer is a mixed tag match between Bam Bam Bigelow and Luna Vachon versus Doink and Dink. <clears throat> okay, first of all, before I get into this, why the fuck does Howard Finkel have hair? I know they had the, the hair club for men or whatever the fuck guy on the show, I guess is kind of an advertisement for that, but no, Fink, no, no. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, they had a lot of celebrities on the show. I meant to mention that earlier. They had a lot of celebrities on this show. But man, I'm 27 years old. I don't know who the fuck these people are, so <laughs> I'm not gonna... Like, I know Burt Reynolds is, just pretty much based off of the Longest Yard remake that they did in, like, 2004 or whatever. But, uh, I don't know who a lot of these people are, so I'm not gonna get into it too much. I'm not gonna pretend like I know. I am a millennial. Anyways, think as hair, Bam Bam Luna, Doink Tink. What a matchup. <laughs> um, look, man, I... You know, you look at on on paper... It looks ridiculous, right? You have a fucking midget clown and a regular sized clown versus a guy with flames on his head and a crazy chick with a mohawk, right? Looks like a recipe for disaster. But I'm watching all these guys and all four people and all four people in this match have like 
a natural athleticism about him. Bam Bam, and, I mean, you know, everybody talks about Bam Bam as like one of the pioneers of like really mobile big men, you know, along with guys like Vader and stuff like that. But man, Bam Bam can move with how big he was. I forgot how big, I mean, I, uh, I never really watched Bam Bam. You know, he was kind of before my time, really. Um, as far as WWF goes, really, nobody in this match I've really ever watched long term. Never seen Doink. I've never sat down and watched a Doink match. I obviously know who he is. I've seen clips and little, maybe little YouTube clips here and there. But I've never watched a Doink match from beginning to end like this. So it was really interesting to see all these characters I've heard of and watch how they worked in the ring. And I thought Bam Bam and Doink actually had very good chemistry together. Even though I hear... I've heard like on various podcasts that these guys didn't like each other, or at least Matt Bourne and Bam Bam didn't. And I think Doink actually becomes a different person like later this year, doesn't he? I don't know if that's the reason or what, or if that's just a coincidence or what it is. But nonetheless, I think Doink and Bam Bam work together. But this match overall wasn't that great. Um, you know, there were some good spots here. I feel like everybody was competent. Even like, especially like Luna. I forgot, like Luna, like when she would do moves and sell and bump. You know, just like Owen, I, th I feel like she was even ahead of her time, too. Especially in this time period where there weren't a lot of quality women wrestlers in the mainstream, at least. I thought Luna did a really good job in this match. And I think even, even fucking Dink, he did, you know, a few, he did like a couple moves in here that were pretty impressive without, you know, obviously his restrictions, right? Um, but yeah, this match kind of had a, an abrupt finish. You know, Bam Bam hits his headbutt for the win, but it kind of felt like it came out of nowhere with no buildup, but I'm not going to pretend like I wanted this match to go any longer anyways. Um, so yeah, Bam Bam, Luna get the win. A weird little post-match deal here. You had Luna and Bam Bam attacking Dink and Doink after the match. They both go for a splash. Bam misses Doink, but Luna doesn't miss Dink. So somebody messed up there and it made a really <laughs> weird, the crowd didn't know how to react because they like clearly messed up. Very, very strange. And they kind of just, they weren't in sync at all with that. And they just kind of sauntered out of the ring and went to the back. It was kinda just a weird thing that happened there. But nonetheless, glad it wasn't longer than it was. Um, <laughs> uh, what do you have after that? And after that, Macho Man Randy Savage versus Crush. Now, I... I have no idea what the story behind this match was, if there even was a story. That's one thing they didn't have, you know, during this time period was video packages. They had one for Owen and Brett, but otherwise they didn't really lay out the story between anyone on this show, and I think that's really what hindered this show a lot. I didn't know why Macho Man and Crush were fighting. I didn't know who to care for. I mean, I also, we, everyone knows Macho Man. Crowd popped hard for Macho Man coming out. I guess this, I can ascertain that this was just a way to get Macho Man out there and put a performance on, you know, to give the crowd that Macho Man that they want. You know, this is no Savage Steamboat, this is no, you know, whatever the fuck. It's just a novelty act to get Macho Man out there and give him his entrance music and all that stuff and put smiles on the crowd's face, whatever it is. But the match itself was, it was dumb. The stipulation was dumb. It was, it was a last man standing match, I guess. I don't know if that's what they call it, called it, but that's essentially what it was, kind of. So the premise is when you pin your opponent, they have 60 seconds to get back in the ring. And you don't win the match until, you know, you that's until somebody's unable to get back in the ring in 60 seconds. But like, first of all, I mean, Macho Man gets pinned in this match in like 30 seconds. You know, he, Macho Man comes out first and then Crush comes out. Savage then attacks him in the aisle way. They get into a scuffle. Crush, you know, throws him into the barricade and pins him, like, right away. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> this guy was WWE champion, like, a year or two ago. And now he's just getting pinned in 30 seconds from a barricade bump. And then you have Crush, who is this huge dude. I don't know if they had any major plans for this guy or what. But, you know, after Crush pins Macho Man. And then Macho Man gets back in the ring. And then he pins Crush in, like, 30 seconds after that. So both these guys are looking like absolute geeks out there losing in mere seconds. It's also stupid because, you know, Randy Savage, he pinned Crush in the ring and then he had to like scoot him out awkwardly to the outside because that's the premise, right? You have to make it to the ring, make it inside the ring in 60 seconds. But uh, uh, what happens if you get pinned in the ring and you're already in the ring? Oh, no, just throw him out there, I guess. <laughs> they didn't really think it through that much. And that's very clear. Um, but luckily, it didn't last too, too long. After that, they like fight in the in the crowd a little bit to the to the back. I think uh, 
Savage like throws him into the doors and then pins him. <laughs> I guess because all of a sudden that's just such a debilitating move is pushing him into doors. Um, pins him and then he tries to like hog tie him. I don't even know what the setup was, but there was like a rope hanging from the ceiling. So he's trying to hog tie Crush by the feet, but he's like not able to do it. But he like kind of ties him, ties a rope around his feet, and then he like pulls the rope. So Crush is hanging there like a like a slab of meat in a butcher shop. But then it kind of falls and then Crush <laughs> gets untied, but he still has, to, still has to sell that he's stuck. But Macho Man makes it back to the ring and then Crush obviously isn't able to because he's quote unquote all tied up. And then Macho Man wins. Weird, weird match. Weird stipulation that doesn't need, that didn't even look good on paper, and it looked worse in execution. But it let everybody see Macho Man, which I guess at the end of the day was the goal here. So was what it was, but uh, it didn't make anybody look good. Um, and if if I'm I could be wrong, but I think this is like one of Macho Man's last WWF matches, which is a real real shame to go out on that note. But nonetheless. After that, we have a women's championship match. Alundra Blaze versus Lilani Kai. Featuring a mullet on Mike Kyoto. But that's beside the point. This match here, I guess, was an attempt to uh, kind of restart, revamp the women's division. Because before this, it had been virtually, not virtually, it had been very much non-existent. Um, I mean, give or take, yeah. Before and after two, three years of this date, there really wasn't a women's division. You had Alundra Blaze, you had people like Luna Vachon, but that was pretty much it during this time period. You you didn't have the, the numbers to build a division around. At this point in time, as far as society goes, I don't know if people are really interested in seeing women wrestle at this point. It would it'd be many, many years before that concept was even a credible thing to think about. So really really bizarre to watch during this time period how they treated it right <laughs> you know you have fucking jerry lawler who is such a pig dude like he's not talking about the wrestling at all he's just talking about how a lunger blaze has a horse face and how fucking lalani kai is old as fuck or whatever i don't know really <laughs> it doesn't like i said a lot of his commentary does not age well but to be fair, there wasn't a lot of reason to care about this match in the first place. It was really just kind of a, um, I guess, a novelty act of sorts because Lalani Kai wrestled at the first WrestleMania, so 10 years prior to this. So there's kind of a callback to that first, you know, there's, there's a 10th WrestleMania. It's an anniversary, right? It's a special milestone. So they throw her out there. They throw this old bag out there, you know, <laughs> wrestled at the very the inaugural, inaugural show, right? Versus Alundra Blaze, who is by far the most competent wrestler they have on the roster. You know, I keep... I've already used the phrase ahead of their time way too many times on this podcast. I apologize. But she really was Alundra Blaze ahead of her time here. The suplexes, the bumping, the selling, the uh, the kicks, the all the different stuff she was doing was incredibly fluid and smooth and believable. I mean, I feel like if she was, you know, born... 10, 15 years later, and she was a part of this women's revolution that we got going on right now, she would fit perfectly in with that. But unfortunately, it's 1994, and nobody gives a fuck about women's wrestling, especially Vince McMahon. So it really didn't amount to much, even though, uh, you know, Blaze, as far as the match itself goes, it was it was fine. It was very quick. Really just a showcase of a lunger Blaze. But even though she got the win here, retained her title, didn't really amount to anything after this. Um... I don't know when she leaves. I think it's shortly after this. Um, definitely within like a year or two, right? Maybe even quicker. I'm not really sure. But, you know, we all know about that whole Nitro spot where she drops the title in the trash. And that's really, you can see why. Because they didn't really put forth any effort to build this as anything more than a let up match. Anything more than, oh, isn't it funny that women are then they're wrestling? Isn't that wacky? Uh, so, yeah, weird time. But um, both you know, both girls worked hard out there for what it was. Like I said, Alundra Blaze looked really good, and it's unfortunate that you know she was in this time period during her, during her uh, her prime because women's wrestling was a joke. And um, glad glad to see where we've come since since this time. So it's good to look back on it and you know acknowledge what a shitty time it was for women's wrestling. But 
how it's progressed. And that kind of stuff will really make you appreciate the women's revolution that we got going on right now. So for that, good stuff. Um, <laughs> speaking about joke titles, we have the tag team championship on the line next. Men on a mission versus the Quebecers. So for anyone unfamiliar, because I'm pretty unfamiliar, or at least I was, Men on a Mission consist of Mabel and Mo, right? Mabel is, of course, Viscera, Big Daddy V, and Mo is just another big black guy. I don't know. But they come out to a rap song because they're black, and it's the 90s, and <laughs> it's very 90s, a very 90s feel. They come out, they have their manager, whose name is Oscar, rapping them to the ring. Like I said, it just had a very, like... Man, hip-hop used to be so innocent, man. I kind of miss those days. Nowadays, it's all about bitches and hookers and drugs. Back then, it was just like, bibbidi bobbidi boobidi bop or whatever. I don't know. Um, is that racist? I don't think so. Anyways, <laughs> going off the rails here. Um, so, Men on a Mission come out, and the Quebecers come out. Quebecers who consist of the, the Mountie and Pierre. Pierre also known as PCO, was the ROH world champion a mere few months ago. So it's crazy to see the longevity that guy has and the path that that guy's taken. Wrestling at WrestleMania 10 and then being ROH champion in 2019. Absurd, absurd. But match itself was uh, not that great. Uh, the bell rings to begin the match and then 20 seconds go by. And then Mabel is absolutely gassed. Who, boy, I mean, I can't blame him. That's a big bitch. But, um, yeah, both Mo and Mabel were struggling out there a little bit. Um, you know, outside of that, there were a few good spots in the match. You had, um, the Quebecers do a double suplex onto Mabel, which is pretty impressive. Um, although, considering the Quebecers are heels, I don't understand the logic in having them doing something super impressive considering we're supposed to boo these guys right you know canadians remember remember they're canadians they suck right so don't know why that happened i guess that's really all that they could do to make this match interesting maybe um we have mo doing a senton that was pretty impressive they do like a little like a you know like how heavy machinery does the compactor they did kind of like a shitty version of it a more clumsy version of it, but nonetheless, the match ends in a countout, which obviously the titles don't change hands on a countout. However, the champions coming into the match were the Quebecers, but even though the match ended in a countout, the men on a mission grabbed the titles and held them in the air as if they just won them. I legitimately don't know if they <laughs> were just confused or what, but maybe they were so fucking exhausted that there was no more blood going to their brain and they thought they were champions. Who knows? But overall, this match was kind of a mess. Um, but you could say that about a lot on this show. Especially the next match. While Men on a Mission and the Quebecers had a train wreck of a match, at least it only lasted like, I don't know, six or seven minutes. At least it wasn't... I, I don't know how long this next match was, but it felt like an eternity. Lex Luger versus Yokozuna for the WWF Championship. I'll repeat that for the WWF Championship, aka a marquee match at Wrestle Fucking Mania, as my cat meows in the background. You know, I so I take notes on these matches, little just a few bullets here and there. For this match, I have one bullet. It's just all caps. Yikes! <laughs> Man, this was a terrible, terrible match. First of all, okay, the whole premise here of this show, Yokozuna is the WWF champion. First of all, that's a big bitch, I get it. He's amazing to look at, looks like an unbeatable monster, but the dude at this point in his career just cannot move, dude. He's too big, he's too big. Now on top of that, you're gonna make this motherfucker work double duty? <laughs> Are you kidding me? They, they had the Royal Rumble earlier in the year, which is the year where Lex Luger and Bret Hart both got eliminated at the same time at the end of the match, so therefore they were both the winners. Now, you hear that and you're like, well, the natural progression would be, okay, let's have a triple threat match for the WWF title at WrestleMania. Would have made sense, right? But I guess they're just like, erp, derp, derp, mm, don't want to do that. That'd be too easy. So let's make a 600-pounder work two matches. <laughs> um... I don't know, man. I'm, I'm sure there's a there's some semblance of reasoning behind it, but 
I don't know, man. I mean, because in this match, you know, you have Mr. Perfect as a special ref for whatever reason. They don't really explain why, but even he couldn't save this match because, I mean, he looked just as bored and uninterested as the fans did. Um, obviously, you know, Lex Luger, Yoko. Lex Luger's a big guy. Yoko Zuna, obviously, on a different level of big, but both big guys. I mean, what, what do you expect of this match, man? <laughs> We're not going to get Bret Hart versus Owen Hart. It's going to be a clumbering mess. And on top of that, you have, you know, Yoko's going to be, he's going to retain the WWF title here. Spoiler alert. So Yoko's going out there knowing he's going to wrestle another match. So he's saving himself. You know, he's not depleting his energy stores in this match because he has to re wrestle a whole other match within a matter of minutes after this. So automatically, Yoko's already moving at half speed, trying to preserve himself. And then you have Luger, who's a failed version of, Hul of Hulk Hogan 2.0, which, by the way, got to say this, so... It's it's very widely known that Vince McMahon had a hard on for Lex Luger. I mean, you look at him, he looks like a million bucks. You can kind of you you get it from an extent, right? And you know, you gotta think he's he's trying to replace the void that Hulk Hogan left when he left. So we got Lex Luger. Okay, the guy's all American. He's a big jacked bodybuilder, blonde hair, kind of the same thing, right? So it'll work just as well. <laughs> no, it did not. Nobody gives a fuck about Lex Luger. Which is clear. I mean, he got like a moderate pop when he came out, but like Vince McMahon on commentary. So yeah, Vince McMahon, he's not, you know, portrayed as the owner of the company, but he is, but he's also on commentary. <laughs> so the crowds like gives him a, a semi okay pop when Lex Luger comes out for his entrance. But then on Vince, Vince McMahon on commentary as, as Lex is coming out. He's just like, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Like really out of place, bizarrely delivered, just yelling yes, yes into the microphone. Why are you yelling yes, Vince? No, we don't care about Lex Luger just because you're yelling yes into your stupid microphone. He's really grasping at straws, trying to get people at home to care about Lex Luger. But this match did him no favors because literally this match is like, 20 minutes of Yokozuna having one hand on Lex Luger's neck in a quote-unquote nerve hold. I mean, this match is so slow, and Yokozuna is literally too immobile to put on a legitimate rest hold onto him. So he literally has Lex Luger on his back, Yoko is on his knees with his hands on his neck in a nerve hold, and he's just... He's not like even like trying to, he's not even kind of trying to portray that he's applying pressure on the neck or anything. He just has his hand on his neck. He looks bored. Lex Luger is on the ground. He looks bored. He's not selling it at all. <laughs> Mr. Perfect looks bored. The crowd doesn't care. The commentators are falling asleep. Why is this a WWF championship match at WrestleMania? For the love of fuck. Went on way too long. Didn't feel like a big match. Like I said, there's no... A video package to really explain the story here. There's no extra pomp and circumstance at all. Complete waste of time and a non-finish. You have Mr. Fuji and uh, Jim Cornette getting involved because they're both managing Yokozuna because apparently he needs so much help that he needs two managers. They're both laid out in the ring. Lex Luger beats the shit out of him. And then Lex Luger knocks Yokozuna down, has him down for the pin, but Mr. Perfect sees him that Lex Luger has Yokozuna pinned, that he's on, he's literally on him, pinning him. Mr. Perfect sees him, he's like, er, 90 degrees, turns to go look at Jim Cornette. Turns 90 degrees to go look at fucking uh, Mr. Fuji, which I guess, I guess it's supposed to be like a, a screw job. I guess it was like an intentional screw job on Mr. Perfect's part, at least I hope it was. That would be the only thing that would explain it, but it just looked really bad. And, you know, Lex Luger gets frustrated with, with Mr. Perfect, as he should shoves Mr. Perfect, and then Kurt Henning disqualifies Le Lex Luger, so Yokozuna retains the title via disqualification. So all of that bullshit, and it's a DQ finish. Such a waste of time. Could have just had a triple threat match. Don't know why they didn't. I'm sure there's some reasoning behind it in Vince McMahon's deluded head, but whatever, man. Train wreck of a match, maybe the worst I've ever seen. Um, what do we have after that, though? So Yokozuna retains... We'll defend against Bret Hart later in the show. After that, you have <laughs> Adam Bomb versus Earthquake. Literally a 30-second squash match, as should have been Lex Luger versus Yokozuna. But I digress. I digress. Um, Earthquake, you know, gives him a splash. <laughs> I love, 
I love Earthquake's finisher, how he like bounces in the ring like an earthquake. Get it? And then um, his, his music, the, the rumbling music, it was all very funny and very, very representative of the times, um, for better or worse. But finally, after that, we have something, something of quality to watch. The first ever, at least on TV, the first ever ladder match in WWF for the Intercontinental Championship. Shawn Michaels versus Razor Ramon. It is really interesting to see where the ladder match started. Because obviously nowadays, it's all a stunt show. It's all, let's set up this ladder across from this ladder onto another ladder and then throw the guy from the ladder onto the second very ladder, bounce off a Canadian destroyer into a super kick, a plancha, a Sai moon salt, or whatever the fuck. <laughs> if you've listened to me for a while, I, I harp on ladder matches nowadays and how I hate them. Um, but this, this match showed, I won't say this is, I can't just objectively say this is a better version of it. Because they're still figuring it out, right? They're still building on what the ladder match would become. In my opinion, I feel like peak ladder matches came, you know, early 2000s or so. Around the time the TLC matches that were happening, the matches you saw during the Attitude Era. Those ladder matches, I think, contributed to a lot of what made the ladder match such a great match. But this first match really set the tone. And in its own way, I really loved how they utilized... The stipulation here um it wasn't about stunts you know you had obviously you had sean doing the splash off the ladder which is like an iconic moment because it's the first time anybody's ever seen something like that on wwf right but it wasn't about you know how high can i jump off this ladder or it's not oh how many different tricks can i do to make this ladder do fancy things to hurt my opponent it was two guys who wanted the intercontinental championship and the only way to get it was to struggle up that ladder to defend against your opponent and to make sure that your opponent is incapacitated enough to where you have time to climb that ladder before they can rip you off. That's the basic premise of a ladder match, and I feel like that's a lost art. But I feel like these guys here did that very well. Um, I mean, it's just interesting to see how, so to watch in real time, wrestlers figure out how to have a ladder match. And in this match here, you had, you know, urgency, you had drama. It wasn't just pops. It wasn't just fancy moves for cheap pops. It was two guys having a really good wrestling match. And the ladder was almost secondary a lot of times. The ladder was something that supplemented the match. It wasn't the, you know, the centerpiece of it, if that makes any sense. You know, they're using the ladder as a weapon more so than they're jumping off of their, um using it to hurt their opponent enough to where they're incapacitated enough so that they can climb the ladder, so they have time to climb the ladder. Really good storytelling here throughout. Um, you know, just like I said with Bam Bam and Doink, I, I really haven't sat down and watched a Razor Ramon match ever. I've seen a few clips here and there. I, I know what he's all about. I know his entrance music. I know his character. I've seen the vignettes. I've seen you know, a few things here and there. From beginning to end, I've never really seen a Razor Ramon it, uh, match in its entirety. And what a match to start off with. But um, Razor was like almost like kind of clumsy. But not clumsy to make the match suffer. But it was like almost like a realistic level of clumsy because he's a big dude. People forget because people associate him with Kevin Nash and Kevin Nash is obviously enormous, bigger than Razor Ramon, but people forget how big Razor is. Really, he's just a bull in there. The way he runs the ropes is kind of funny looking, but the dude, once he hits you with a shoulder block after doing that, you're like, oh, never mind. This guy's a monster. Um, so good stuff from Razor, great stuff from Sean. Ultimately, Razor gets the win here. Love the finish too. So Sean's climbing the ladder. Razor sees him climbing the ladder, pushes it over. Sean crotches himself on the top rope after falling off the ladder. And then, you know, Razor sits the ladder back up and he's climbing it. But Sean's like not completely out of it because he's just like tied up in the ropes and the and tied up in the ropes. So you're, you're, you're watching all this and you're like, wow, is Sean going to get up in time for him to stop Razor? It wasn't, you know, he's laid out on the outside through four tables. It's like, oh, Sean's down, but he might get out of the ropes in time to stop Razor. So there was like a, a tension that was built. There was drama 
you didn't know if the match was going to end or not. It wasn't a formality. So I really like the finish there. I like how they did that. Kept the urgency going. And then Razor ends up getting the win. Um, was he the champion coming in this or not? I don't remember. Either way, he walks out with the Intercontinental title. Um, awesome, awesome stuff from this ladder match here. Maybe um, I would have this number two in my personal matches of the night behind Brett and Owen. But um, considering what Brett and Owen was, that's saying a lot. Um, so good stuff here from Razor and Sean. And that brings us, finally, to the main event. Once again, the WWF Championship is on the line. Once again, we have Yokozuna defending. And he's defending here against Bret Hart. So you have two guys that both had matches earlier in the night. Um, Burt Reynolds, for some reason, making the ring introductions. <laughs> Um, he introduces Roddy Piper as the special guest referee. Roddy looks fucking good here, man. That is a handsome motherfucker. Um, but, uh, he's the ref. I guess he wasn't really active at this point. I think he was more doing acting and stuff. I could be wrong, but I know he en ends up going to WCW eventually and being in the main event scene there. Uh, not as bright a moment for his career, but nonetheless, he's the ref here for whatever reason. And then, uh, so Bret Hart versus Yokozuna. Not as bad as the Yokozuna versus Lex Luger match, but still not that great. Um, Bret can only carry him so much. He is a big guy, after all. And, um, it had its moments. Again, you have Yoko controlling Bret at a lot of points in this match. But at least, at, at least in this match, Yoko isn't, like, conserving himself. So he's kind of going more all out. He's a little more active in this match than he was with Luger. And he has a better dancing partner. So all in all, Yoko's performance was better in this match. But still, man, I mean, he's a 600-pounder that already had a match. So he can only do so much. Um, but Bret Hart, when he had his opportunity to have fire and to come back, um, he did a really great job here at chopping down the monster. The finish was very <laughs> weird. Uh, it's just... So Yoko's going for the bonsai drop. So Bret's on, the, Bret's on his back in the corner and Yoko's climbing to the second rope. And then Yoko just fucking slips, I guess, or <laughs> loses his balance. There's not really a story behind it. He just happens to whoops a daisy, and then he falls off the second rope, and then Brett just pins him for the title in the main event of WrestleMania. <laughs> so if I could, I could say anticlimactic, but man, the crowd popped hard for that. So I guess 1994 fans didn't expect any more than that. So whatever, if that's if it sent the fans home happy, then. Who am I to judge too much, right? But the finish felt weird to me, but all in all, you get the title off of Yokozuna. You put it on Bret Hart. You strap the rocket to Bret, and we're off to the races for the new generation era. The so Bret wins, I just gotta say, post-match. So you have the stuff, you know, Bret wins. He's holding the title, and then the locker room comes out. At least, like, all the good guys come out to celebrate with Bret, but... It's so, like, awkward and strange because they all come out, they just, like, walk out. There's no, like, excitement. They just all walk out. Get in the ring slowly, one by one. They all, like, shake Brett's hand. And then they're all just kind of, like, standing there. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not, like, jumping up and down. There's no champagne. There's no big hugs and, like, jumping, you know what I'm saying? There's no, like, excitement it's just like i don't know 12 13 guys in there just standing with their their arms by their side like looking around like yeah we're out here we're baby faces yay like it was so it was really awkward looking go back and watch it is really funny how absent of emotion everybody is in that ring but two of them like hold up bret hart it's whatever has it's a good shot there but then the best shot of the night is when owen hart comes out now remember Owen Hart beat Bret Hart earlier in the night. He proved that he's better than his brother. He proved that he's the dominant Hart. And now he has to sit, he has to stand there and watch Bret Hart win the WWF Championship, even though he was already proved to be inferior than Owen Hart. Owen Hart has to watch his brother once again get the fame and the titles and the notoriety. He gets all that handed to Bret while Owen is just sitting there like an asshole. 
even though he proved objectively that he's better than Bret Hart by beating him earlier in the night. Now Owen has to watch everybody celebrate Bret even though he lost earlier. So it's a really good story that they're telling there. Really, um, really good nuance with Bret and Owen building up to their eventual steel cage match that they have at SummerSlam. So the story is not over here, but the journey is definitely red hot. Love every minute of what Brett and Owen do. And I can't wait to uh, continue that journey as I go forward with this watch along. So WrestleMania 10. If I can just wrap it up into one beautiful bow for you guys. Save yourself the time. Just watch Brett and Owen and just watch Sean and Razor. Watch those two matches and you'll have the same, if not more, enjoyment than I did watch. I'm, I'm kind of kidding. It was fun. It was funny to watch. Even the bad stuff, it was fun to watch. So depending on what your preference is, I would say those two matches that I listed are really the only good ones on this show. But there were other, you know, the other tomfoolery and shenanigans. It has its own charm and entertainment value as well. So can't complain. I love wrestling, so fuck it. That is about all I got for you guys. Once again, appreciate you guys giving this a listen. Uh, we'll continue. So this is all part of my, uh, you know, 90s Wrestling Wars series. S uh, Sub-series, series, whatever the fuck, I don't know. Still playing around with the title. But basically, WrestleMania 10 occurred in March of 1994. So the next 90s Wrestling War pay-per-view I will be reviewing will be WCW Spring Stampede. Another show I've never seen. I'm sure a lot of characters I've never really watched before, so that will be entertaining as well, as I am confident that you all were entertained today. Um, at least hopefully you were. At least, at least, at least hope you were more entertained than I was during the Lex Luger Yokozuna match. That's really the bar that I've set for myself. Nonetheless, thank you guys once again for listening. I'm hard.